How are we doing? Okay. Chapter 2 is all about renewable power generation. Uh, Some solar and some onshore wind there. Right. So this is the first really interesting analysis I want to share with you, and it's about the cost of generating renewable power. This is Dogger Bank, the biggest offshore wind farm in the world, and it generates 1.2 gigawatts of electricity. It's also set to triple in size and capacity, and when complete, it's going to generate enough power for 6 million homes, which is a decent chunk of all the homes in the UK. The size of each one of these offshore monopoles is 490 feet tall, which makes each blade the length of a rugby pitch. And the UK and Germany and China generate three quarters of all the world's offshore wind between them. So the UK is leading in this. Right. Now, let's have a look at the cost of generating some different forms of power. Right, this is a little plot of... In the decade or so since 2010 through to roughly the present day, the cost of generating power in uh, what the industry calls the levelized cost of energy, which is essentially what it costs you to make it rather than sell it. So anyway, now, a fossil fuel, I've taken coal here as an example, costs about $110 per megawatt hour of electricity, and it has done pretty consistently, this line is flat since 2010. An example, renewable power, onshore wind, started in 2010 at the same level, but has got cheaper. It's now roughly a third. That's onshore wind, wind turbines in fields. Offshore wind, which is famously more expensive because you have to do all the same stuff but at sea. There you go has come down more steeply still and is also now cheaper than uh, my fossil fuel there. And as for solar, don't even get me started, the cost of generating solar power has cratered over the last decade. It's come down by 90%. And so, do we have any economics upper six students in? No? Aha. Well... So what something remarkable happened in about 2019, just as we all went into COVID. It wasn't much talked about, certainly in the press, but it became cheaper to generate a megawatt hour of electricity with renewables than to burn fossil fuels. And this is true with some local exceptions all over the world. These are global figures. And economists call that a tipping point. And moreover... Every one of these curves for renewables is sloping down and exhibiting another thing that economists or maybe it's sociologists are fond of talking about, a learning curve, right? The idea that whatever you do, whether it's putting up a tent or putting up a 500-foot monopole in the North Sea, the more you do it, the better you get at it, and the cost of doing it comes down. And these things will only continue getting cheaper. Now, I should declare that since preparing this slide, which was about 12 months ago, there has been a 2023 update to it and a slight wrinkle in my clean-sounding thesis that the costs of some of these renewables, offshore wind is a good example, have gone up in 2023 due to a kind of perfect storm of inflationary pressures on the price of steel, um, interest rates in what is a very capital-intensive industry you, I'm sure, are familiar with the prices. So they can go up as well as down, but the long-term trend is, I think you'll, I will assert, uh, still very definitely down. So all of that means that today, globally, renewable energy, and these figures are actually solar and wind, Um, accounts for 12% of um, all power. Um, Actually, here's a question. The 12% is the global figure. The UK is not 12%. 
Higher or lower? Higher, very good, yeah. The UK is about 44% in Q3 of 20. The UK generates a lot more of its power renewably than um, uh, many countries. So um, another thing to be pleased about uh, uh, being, uh, being it. We can't take too much, all, all the credit for that. There are various reasons for it. But in terms of putting out um, uh, offshore wind in particular, the UK is doing well. In 2030, this is reckoned to be 40%. These figures are, I think, oh yes, from the Energy Transitions Commission. Uh, in fact, the EU has just given a COP28 target of 42.5% by 2030. COP is the, uh, by the way, the Conference of the Parties, the annual shindig that happens in December each year where all this gets discussed and commitments are made. And by 2050, 75%. There are a range of estimates, actually, beg your pardon. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's try and get that back. There are a range of estimates. I had an error bar on there. Oh, there it is. A range up between 65 and 85% for renewal. So this is a whole-scale transformation in the energy marketplace, if you like, and it is underway now. China installed more solar power last year in calendar 2023 than the US has done in the last three decades. So things are really moving very fast. Now, while wind and solar are by far the most mature of these sectors, there are other forms of renewable power generation where exciting things are happening. Uh, I could talk about geothermal, for example, hydro, but tidal power is another fast-developing renewable sector I thought worth a mention. Um, as technologies go, more at the forefront than the mainstream, but one where the UK is also a world leader. Why? Uh, because we have the best tides, believe it or not. Uh, 11... We have the best... It sounded Trumpian, didn't it? <laughs> We have the best tremendous tides. <laughs> Everyone says so. <laughs> All these other countries with their failing tides. Um, 11 metres is the tidal range to the north and west of Scotland. Uh, it's about the height of this room, nearly. Uh, seven metres, no, not quite. Yeah. Seven metres on the River Thames, as the rowers will know. But 11 metres is a tidal range matched in the world only at one other location. Anyone like to hazard a guess where else apart from the north of Scotland has the highest tidal range in the world? Bay where? Bay the Bay of Fundy. That's close, yeah, Nova Scotia. You're too old to qualify for a piece of chocolate there. <laughs> oh, sorry, I know you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, anyway, 11 metres. We have unmatched uh, tidal range in the UK. So the um, European... Marine Energy Centre is based in the Orkney Isles. Um, and here, as the inventor has helpfully sketched out for us on the beach, is one concept. Um, this is British firm uh, Orbital Power. I hope I can make the little clip play. Are you going to play? There we are. Uh, so also involving large propellers, but underwater. In fact, of course, as the engineers will correct me, they're not propellers, but impellers because they are being driven by the water that flows past them, but because water is 800 times denser than air, it imparts an enormous amount of energy to these blades. Um, and this concept, which is one of a number of firms in this space, um, has two pellers, impellers attached to a, a body roughly the size of a passenger aircraft fuselage, and the whole assembly is taken out into the ocean and anchored to the seafloor where, with a huge change, where the tide flows past it, generating power unlike wind power. This is constant. Well, not constant, but it's predictable. The tide is always flowing. Not always. It's slack twice a day, of course, but it is predictable because the tides are driven by the moon. Um, this has the potential to generate up to 11% of all the UK's energy, according to the Marine Energy Centre. Uh, the challenge is very hard engineering. Um, I'm not sure whether it's harder than putting an oil rig in the, uh, the deep North Sea, um, but it's tough to do. It's an unforgiving environment. OK. 
Okay. So, chapter three. 